This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. Today's episode, we are so excited to bring you a very, very uh, special guest, someone that we respect a lot, and that is what could be considered the founding father of triathlon training and training principles for triathletes and cyclists. Uh, specifically, he's one of the founding uh, guiding coaches on power uh, for cyclists and triathletes. He's written a whole lot of books and the man is Joe Friel himself. Joe Friel is perhaps uh, one of the most famous coaches uh, in the entire triathlon uh, history and industry. He's one of the most accomplished coaches. Uh, he is the co-founder of Training Peaks, the app we love and use so much and base our, our whole coaching on basically. Um, and he's the author of the Triathletes Training Bible, as well as 17 other books uh, with one more in the pipeline at the moment. Um, you can find many of his books online and they are all uh, exceptional uh, uh, novels uh, written about some of the best training philosophies and principles that can abide by to help improve yourself and a lot of our coaching philosophies come from Joe Freel himself and that's why we were so excited to have him on today and so to be able to chat to uh, for an hour to the guru was a really special thing for us uh, and it was just great to see that uh, a lot of the philosophies we've evolved uh, here at Trivelo uh, are still similar and on the same page almost to the word as Joe Freel so um, dad I know that you really started uh, learning from Joe uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s and have continued to do so since then. So uh, you enjoyed this chat as much as I did. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's almost like Joe was a peer uh, and and someone I looked uh, up to. Um, we, we started triathlon at the same time in the 80s and and he was, he was a trailblazer. His ideas were innovative um, even then. Um, but the thing that I I admire the most about Joe and he's done a lot of things. He's written a lot of books. He's helped a lot of people. Um, is his uh, ability to continue to learn and grow, and and that's a that's a really important thing. And to, to think that you know everything um, is is going to leave you left. You, you're going to be left behind the, the rest of the world. And he is continually researching for better ways to to help his athletes improve. Um, and I have the same philosophy. I don't know everything. I'm trying to learn more and more about how athletes tick to make them perform better on race day. Uh, what works, what doesn't work. I've experimented that many times on myself and on you and your brothers um, as well. And and I I just love the way he um, he doesn't um, sit up there as if he he knows everything. He is absolutely researching new and better, faster ways to 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 help pe- people improve. And I think that's his greatest as- attribute. And and for whether you're a cyclist or whether you're a triathlete, there is some absolute gold nuggets in what he said. Um, in the last hour, um, in in the hour to come, um, and and I look, uh, we can learn everything and uh, and and anything from from anybody, and that is the philosophy he has, and it's a philosophy I also have, and I I learn a lot today. It's it's made me question things that I'm doing in our in our in our own program, and I think that's a good thing. Um, um, and he said it himself, uh, you know, he apologizes for things that he wrote in books one two and three because now he's changed his opinion on on the way we should train and and things evolve and and you do a better version of what you had as a as an idea and you just develop it and these are the things that i think is his greatest attribute is his willingness to uh develop and, and evolve uh, as a coach and and he's got some lots he's got lots and lots of good information Let's tell a little bit about his story because we do want to give a bit of uh, more detail into his background because it is a really cool story. Basically, he was uh, really into sport, science and uh, training uh, his entire life, so much so that he quit his job. Uh, I think he was a teacher and he started his own running shop um, in Colorado because he was just that passionate about the sport of running. He hadn't hadn't actually hit triathlons yet and he ran this running shop and out of the shop, uh, he would help... this is really where his coaching career started. He would help people prepare for um, upcoming upcoming races, whether it was fun runs or challenges or marathons. And he start. We talked about this a little bit in the episode. But he started a weekly newsletter, and he would release tips on how to improve as a runner. And that's where really where his coaching career started. 
Yeah, we're talking about the 1980s here, um, and you know he he was you know a, a man who had a lot of conviction about his ability to to do well, and and one of the things he did was quit his job as a as a you know a teacher in a in a school and and opened up uh, a running shop and. You know, he had no no experience in retail, um, and you know he was quite successful. Um, there wasn't a lot of specific running shops in the world at that time. He was one of five, I think, in the world uh, that was just for runners. And he found that, you know, sure he was selling a lot of running shoes, but um, the, the the irony of the story is that uh, most of the people would come in to ask him about training, um, and they would buy a pair of shoes as well. But and he he developed this uh, enjoyment from talking to people about their training and and he found that he had uh, you know some really good ideas and he was imp- implementing some some uh, training schedules and plans for these people and they were beginning to be successful and and this was the start of his journey really and you know you ma- you, you make decisions like giving up your teaching job to do something else and it's 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 a career changing game changing lifestyle changing uh, decision that you make and and looking back now I, I think it's one of the best things he ever if he ever did, and there were times there where it was very difficult. Um, and he says that openly that you know. But the main thing is that I can see Joe has has been relentlessly consistent. Um, whatever he's set his mind to, um, he's followed through, and and he, he's you know developed the running shop and then opened up a triathlon shop by buying a shop next door, which was a bike shop, and that was spectacularly unsuccessful. He said um, because the world wasn't ready for a, a, a triathlon shop. People didn't know whether it was a bike shop or a running shop or a triathlon shop. They had no idea what his specialty was. And and he, I think he learned a lot of lessons from that experience um, of being reasonably unsuccessful from being reasonably successful as a, a running retail shop. Um, but he, he definitely found that he had a passion for coaching people and for, for giving programs to people based in triathlon. And I think that was a turning point as well that, um, you know, the triathlon shop might not have been successful, but it, it certainly uh, gave him... Uh, the opportunity to, to coach more people and that's the next step that he took was uh, look if I want to be a full-time coach and that's what he had aspirations to do he still had to work you know other jobs to keep his his coaching uh, career alive um, to, to make enough money to live um, and and then it just really evolved from that point onwards he does say uh, a pretty similar story to what you say he then uh, a turning point in his life was he friend convinced him to try his hand at a triathlon in 1983 and he just like everyone else just got hooked you know he said the atmosphere the fact that you're doing three events he just found it was an unbelievable sport to be a part of and so enjoyable from that point on he got hooked into triathlons and he had gained a following uh through his through his newsletter um and by the late 80s uh early 90s he was already a renowned coach with a big following and because of that uh he was one of the first people to really start trialing and testing uh, the power meter and uh, when that came along and uh, yeah from from that point onwards uh he was really he's, he's really had a big hand in revolutionizing uh, a lot of things in the industry and uh, with regards to power meters with regards to co-founding training peaks and uh that's what's led him to this point as being one of the founding fathers of uh, triathlon training i would say i, th- I think you're right george it, you know the next step that he took was to put all his thoughts into a book and and I think that was a key turning point in his uh, in his career as a as almost the guru. Um, he put all his ideas into a book, and and uh, you know it was for triathletes, swimming, biking, and running. And then the next thing he did was you know I can do the same thing for, for cyclists. Um, uh, and and you know he called it the training, uh, the triathlon training bible and the cycling training bible. And it was it was you know every every budding triathlete had Joe's book on their shelf including me and i learned lots of things from from the way he thought about uh, training in the 80s and and i used a lot of those principles that he was putting in his book uh, on myself um and and they were very successful principles um and you know adding my own versions to things and and trying to evolve and and that's what what joe's done and and you know 17 or 18 books later um i think uh you know he certainly uh He's established himself as someone you would look to for, for help and, and, uh, and information on, on how to become a better version of yourself. And I think that at the end of the day is what his really, his, his shining achievement is. 
So without further ado, we will actually bring you the man himself, Joe Friel. And for me, it was such an enjoyable chat because uh, for me, for any Tribello athlete and for anyone that listens to the podcast, I'm sure you will find the same experience I had uh, with this episode in that I felt like I was just listening to the USA version of Coach Jared Donnelly, which was kind of special to hear uh, you kind of use the same philosophy, same words, and more importantly, the same care uh, for athletes. You can hear some of the same uh, principles or sentences that uh, he was saying that we've said plenty of times, or you specifically have said plenty of times on this podcast, and that was really encouraging. So we really enjoyed this episode. Without further ado, here is Joe Friel. Joe Friel, uh, a very big, warm welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much, Jordan. Glad to be here. We always start with a bit of a bang of a question, and that is, uh, what does the sport of triathlon mean to you? Oh, man. I go way back with triathlon. I, um, you know, it, it really has kind of became my, my life for many, many years. I, was, I started running back in the 70s, and um, in the early 80s, the 1980, I opened a running store. 1983, I took down, I bought the bike store next door to my running store, took down the wall between the two and had what was probably the first triathlon store in the world. The world wasn't ready for a triathlon store then. And the reason I did that was because I had hired some guys to work in my running store who were triathletes among some of the very first in the US. And they got me turned on to the sport. So I, I tried it. And sure enough, I fell in love with, the, with triathlon also. And so I started racing and that led to buying the bike store and eventually all the stuff that's happened since then. And it's just been a, a long, a long career of being involved in the sport. And it's, it's been, for me, it's just been um, uh, just like a gift from heaven. Quite honestly, it's been, I, I enjoy doing, I, I like talk, working with athletes and I enjoy coaching. So everything, it's kind of like fell together all at the same time for me back a long time ago, 40 years ago. I was just going to say, and uh, I'm going on from that uh, particular um, point that you've made, things evolve, don't they, over, over the journey? And is it, is it the same philosophy that you had as a coach? Let's put your coaching hat on for a, a second here. When you first started helping runners and then going into helping triathletes, your, your philosophy then and what you know now after 40 years of doing that, is there much difference from what you can look back on how you were coaching athletes in the beginning? Oh, a uh, world of difference. Yeah, um, it, it has certainly evolved uh, and continues to evolve. It's never, you're never done with it. It's always a learning experience. Uh, as with almost everything in life, that's just the way it is when you're coaching. And uh, my philosophy back then really wasn't well-defined. I, I wasn't exactly sure who I was or what I was supposed to be doing, except for an athlete for a race. And so I experimented a lot. I always started the experimentation with myself. If I would try something out to see if it works, I would try it with me. And then I would try it with my son, Dirk, you know, and uh, see how it worked for him. And if it worked for both of us, then I would try it on an athlete I thought it might work for and see how it worked for him. And eventually, so everything just kind of evolved that same way of just all this experimentation all the time of, how to do all this stuff. And from that grew a philosophy of how to coach, but it didn't start off being a philosophy. It started out just being happenstance. Let's just try things and see what happens. And now it's evolved into a, into a way I, I see the world. And sometimes I have to stop myself and say, you know, it's time to rethink what you're doing. Are you sure this is the right way to do it still? Because things do change. And from time to time, I make a decision that, you know, that's, that's just not the way to do it. I'm sorry I said that in that book. I'd like to apologize for having said that 20 years ago. But uh, unfortunately, I can't go back and rewrite a book 20 years ago to make it correct then. But So I'm kind of like stuck with all the stuff I said <laughs> in the last 40 years and um, because it does change. It keeps on changing all the time. That's funny because that's the exact same as the way we kind of operate. You know, Dad has started with himself experimenting and then I'll probably cop the next experimentation. And then if it passes that test, it'll, it'll go on to an athlete. So what would you say uh, to summarize kind of your core principle philosophies now? I know that's a really difficult question to answer, but 
um, you know, wrapping it all up to what you've what you've been changing and, and come to a point now. Yeah, um, I, I can. This is actually a good good subject for me. I'm, I'm right now working on a project that has to do with kind of trying to professionalize the sport, the, the profession of coaching. Um, I'm working on a, this is a mass project. It's going to take about a year and a half to do all this. But and one of the things we started out with in this project was talking to coaches about defining their their style of coaching, their methodology of coaching, and their philosophy of coaching. Of those three, philosophy is the most difficult. Everybody kind of struggles with trying to come up with what their philosophy is all about. And as I mentioned, mine evolved over time. What it has become, I would say it's been this for probably close to 20 years, although I didn't really define it until maybe a dozen years ago. It, my philosophy is that which is measured improves. That, that's kind of the way I see the world. So I, and that also came about because um, I was, I realized very early in my coaching that if I could figure out what was holding back a client from achieving his goal, I called that a limiter, this thing that stopped them from achieving their goal. In other words, if this didn't, wasn't the situation right now for this athlete, he could already achieve the goal and wouldn't need me. So if I can figure out what these things are that are standing between the athlete and success, and I can, if you will, fix these things, then the athlete can achieve the goal. And so I start measuring those things, those things that I know or, or feel are standing in the way of success. And from that, from that methodology evolved a philosophy, which is that which is measured and proves. So if I, if I find a thing that needs to be improved, I start measuring it. And I talk to the athlete frequently about that thing. I look for this thing all the time or things. It may be a lot of things. Not, maybe, not necessarily physiological, it could be psychological, it could be nutritional, it could be lifestyle, it could be all kinds of things. But if I can fix these things, then the athlete achieves the goal. So that which is measured improves is my philosophy. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, one of the things that leads me to think about that is how the importance of goal setting. Um, and, and we hear and we read uh, how important it is to have goals and, and set a set a target and, and I'm a believer in that as well and it gets me out of bed I want to get on the starting line and know that if I look back I've trained you know the, the way I wanted to and I've arrived at the race day in the shape that I want to be because I've set myself a target and a goal you might have some athletes and we de definitely have some athletes that they set goals that are possibly out of their reach um how, sure. have you come across that and and an example I can think of is someone who says, "I want to, I want to go to Kona. I want to qualify for Kona," and yeah. and you you look at their their level of ability in their particular age group, and you just see that at this particular time they have no chance. How do you go about dealing with that? That happened to me in 1992. Is the first time that ever happened to me. I had an athlete who came to me, great guy. Um, I really liked him, um, and, but his goal was to qualify. And I began looking at data from his previous races and, and realized, came to realize that this is not realistic. He's he, he really, this is something that would be an, uh, an amazing goal, but it would almost be something that was um, kind of like impossible to achieve for him. I can certainly understand why he went. I, I knew this guy's history and I knew how he came to this point in time. And it was a lifestyle issue. It had to do with his life. It had to do with his family. It was a very, very deep issue for him. He, he had lost his son in an auto accident. And I won't go through the whole story, but he, he, he was dealing with that. And he, he came to realize the way to get out of this depression was to qualify for Kona. So I'm now dealing not only with an athlete who wants to do something which is difficult, borderline impossible, but his life somewhat depends on it. Mm. Not easy. This is this is a gigantic challenge. I never, I didn't want to come out and say to him, you know, this is not going to work. You cannot qualify. I'm just not going to say that to the guy. So we started uh, looking at data. And um, so I told him that there was one thing he should do. And that's to go back to all the qualifying races and look for athletes he's competed against and how he's done with them who've qualified. 
how his times compare with other athletes who qualified, in, especially in races he has done, and, and give me some give me some feedback on what you think the opportunity is that the likelihood is of, of you achieving this goal. I want to give an idea where, where we're starting from, and I'm going to let you be the one who decides where we are right now. So he did that, and this went on for a couple of weeks and finally came back to me and he came to the realization that this was really not something that was possible. Didn't change his desire to do it. He still wanted to do it. He wanted me to help him become the best athlete he possibly could, which I was certainly willing to do, but it was just something that was going to be a long, long reach for him to ever get to that point. If he ever did, as it turned out, um, he actually was won the raffle the next year. <laughs> and so he was able to get in the race without even qualifying. Uh, so I flew over to Kona to support him. Uh, he, he's just a great guy. And I wanted to be there with him. And uh, he made the cutoff, uh, you know, all the way through the race, made the midnight cutoff. I walked with him to the finish line. Um, uh, and he was, it was a, like an ecstatic moment in his life. This was like one of the proudest moments of his life to finish Ironman Kona. He has since then has gone back every year. That was 1993. He's gone back every year since 1993 to be there for Kona, with the exception, of course, of this year. And um, he's, he's, a, he's a physician. And so he, he, he went so far as to start a, uh, um, a, a seminar for physicians in his field. But they would come over to Kona the week before the race. He would make money on this, having all these doctors pay to be there. He would give them a, a one-week seminar. He would take all the money that he made from this and give it to the Iron Man Foundation. Hmm. He wouldn't keep a penny. It all went to Iron Man. It, his life revolves around Iron Man to this day. I've never known anybody who has who is so involved with the sport as he is, even to the point of giving away money and taking a loss every year he would do this just so he could be of, of assistance to the race. So he's an amazing individual. He's still a very good friend of mine. He occasionally will have me go over with him and uh, be there the week of Kona for him, and which is a which is a, a real honor for me to be there with him because this is this is his life is the Ironman. It's an amazing story. It, it is an amazing story. It's great you've told it, and it, you know you've you've coached a lot of people in your forty odd years. Um, you must have so many stories of of uh, relationships that you've built um with your with your clients and obviously it's a professional relationship but but it goes deeper doesn't it it, it, it you oh. you form a bond with with almost everybody and you get to know them you get to know what their intricacies are they're good they're bad um you know tell me about tell me about that journey that you've had and 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 I'm I'm imagining that's what gets you up every day because you oh. seem to me like you just love helping people and that seems to be your core principle it is my one of my business philosophies. If you talk about separate from my coaching philosophy, is that you get back what you what you give away. And so my what I've always done with my business over the years is try to give away as much as I could. Somebody has a question, I don't care if they're paying me money or not. I'm going to answer the question, help them as best I can. Uh, can't always help them, but some I, I try to do as best I can. So, so that is certainly true. My clients are have been have become some of my closest friends. I've got many, many clients that go back, like the other fellow, go back 30 or more years who I stay in touch with, who we are just very good friends. Um, some of my best friends have been athletes I've coached over the years. And so it's it's just it's been a it's just a gift to me to be in this profession and meeting all the people I've met and and uh, helping them, you know, achieve their goals, hopefully, and uh, being a part of their lives. You, you've really become very much involved in somebody's life as a coach. You're not just like a, a doctor or somebody outside providing a service. You're really involved in a person's life trying to figure out 
how they can do something which is extremely important to them. And to be a part of that and be allowed into that person's life is like, a, it's like an amazing gift. So yeah, it's, it's, it's ongoing. What, what are the things in, if you could recollect over the journey, what are the things that, that are holding some of these clients that you've had back from achieving their goals? Is there anything, anything you, you can identify that, you know, if they could only do this better, they would actually achieve what they're trying to, what they're trying to aspire to? Yeah, there are lots and lots of things, but let me just narrow it down to the biggest thing, the one that I almost have always had to deal with, 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 um, with athletes who have high goals. And that has to do with lifestyle, basically. Find I have to get involved in the athlete's lifestyle to help them achieve their, their sport goal. For example, uh, if athletes who came to me over the years didn't come to me because they wanted to, to just finish a local 5K. That's, I, didn't, I never saw those people. I always saw the person who wanted to qualify for Kona, the person who wanted to be on the podium at Worlds, who wanted to win a national championship, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the people I always saw. So they have extremely high goals. And the, the, the risk of not achieving their goals is very, very high also because there's at that level, it's extremely difficult to perform like that unless everything comes together just right. So the first conversation I always have with an athlete, it seems like, has to do with their lifestyle. Tell me about your life. That's where I start. And it's little things. It's like, you know, how much, how much sleep do you get at night? What do you eat? When do you eat? All kinds of things like that. And what always, almost, almost always comes down to is I discovered the athlete has just got too much going on in their lives. And so what I tell them is, and this, this is sometimes hard to take, and a lot of people really kind of are repulsed by this idea, but what I tell them is you can only have three things in your life. With that goal, if your goal is to qualify, if your goal is to be on the podium at Worlds, to win a national championship, you can only have three things in your life. You can have your family. We're not going to do away with that. That comes first. You can have your career. You're not going to quit your job. And you can have training. Nothing else. And that's hard to say to somebody because I'll have people say to me, well, you know, I really want to be, I really want to be on the local homeowners association because I think I can do a lot to help the community. Great. Why don't you save it until after you've qualified? That'd be a super goal after you qualify. For right now, let's just kind of put, put it on the back burner. Or they come to me and say, you know, I'd like to volunteer for this, this nonprofit organization in my community, which I've got a lot of strong feelings for. I've been giving them money, but money's not enough. I want to volunteer my time. Excellent. Let's wait till after you've gotten on the podium at Worlds. Then you can do that, and that'll be a super thing to do. But until then, only three things in your life. Until then, only three things in your life. Why? Because as soon as we start adding a fourth thing, a fifth thing, a sixth thing to your life, something's got to give someplace. What always winds up giving people give up is sleep. I'll go to bed later and I'll get up earlier. So instead of getting eight hours of sleep a night or whatever it may be when they're doing three things, now they've got five things and they're getting six hours of sleep a night. Well, guess what? Sleep is when fitness occurs. Sleep doesn't occur during the workout or immediately after the workout, I mean, fitness doesn't, it occurs while you're sleeping. So if you're not getting sleep, we're not getting fitness. We're wasting some of our workout time. So that, that's the reason for all this. I'm not trying to be a bad guy and take, keep you from doing things you want to do in your life, but you told me you want to do X. And I'm telling you, the only way you can do X is if you abide by my rule, which is only three things in your life until you've achieved that goal. That I would say that's 90% of the people I talk to. That's the conversation we start with right there. There are some who've already figured this out and they've got it narrowed down. In that case, I start looking for more deep things. Their nutrition, their, their, um, their training, how they've trained in the past, huh? group workouts, all kinds of stuff I start looking at. But that, that's number one almost always for athletes. They're not getting enough sleep. 
I'd like to touch on the sleep thing a bit more. And uh, do you have any data on how much is required? Because I, from what I've read and uh, heard is that you know it is individualized. Some people can recover better off slightly less, although some people believe they can perform well on slightly less, even though that's not true. Um, so for the age grouper, for example, how much sleep do they need to be recovering properly and get that fitness gain? You're probably right. There's not a lot of research on this, but it's probably individualized. We know, for example, there is some research on, for example, uh, teenagers. Teenagers need a lot of sleep. We're probably talking about 10 hours of sleep or even more uh, per night because their body is going through this process of changing. That's what sleep is all about, is it's, it's changing uh, to become a new person when you wake up in the morning. And so that the younger people really need a tremendous amount of sleep. And as we get older, that probably becomes less as we go through time, through the decades. But I just tell people, you need to be aiming for at least seven hours of sleep a night. Let's not try to make this too complicated. We're not going to do a research study on you to figure out what works best for you, because we really don't know how to do that research study. Let's just make an assumption. The assumption is you need at least seven hours of sleep a night. So that means if you've got a 5 a.m. or let's say 5.30 a.m. more common um, master swim in the morning, you need to get to bed at least seven hours before you get up. So if you got to get up at 5 a.m. to make it to the pool in time, you've got to be in bed by 10 p.m. Got to be in bed by 10 p.m. I prefer 9 p.m. just to make sure. Give us a little bit of a pad there to make sure it works out. But 10 p.m. at the latest. So that, that's kind of the way I talk to the athletes. We've got a minimum we're, we're aiming for. If we can get more than that, fantastic. And if I discover they're not doing well down the line, I may assume that they need more. If they're only getting seven, we'll start aiming for eight at that point. So it's, it's a moving target, but I would say seven is probably a minimum. You found, Joe, that uh, when you've tried to get this philosophy across to your athletes who you know aren't getting enough sleep and they start to change it, have you found that they've improved? Definitely. You very definitely see it in the athlete and how they respond to training, um, how they feel when they do a workout. You start asking questions about how the workout go, how did you feel coming into it, what was your mental approach to the workout, how hard did it seem? And you compare that with when, when, when you weren't coaching them and they were doing similar workouts, but they were doing things that were, I hate to say wrong, but they were wrong, not getting enough sleep, doing too many hard workouts, that kind of stuff. If we start seeing a compilation of all these things going on with the training, I'll eventually see that they're accomplishing more in the workouts. They're making greater progress. So it's a lot of things. It's not just sleep. There's a lot of things going on. It's hard to, it's hard to differentiate and say it's just sleep mm. because there's so many things that are going on. You start coaching somebody, you're making changes in lots of things, and those things all add up to being better performance. Let's just dig a little bit more into some of those other things, and, and we totally agree. It's never one thing that improves the athlete. It's always a combination of a lot of little things that they do well, and, and I really want to hear your ideas. Um, and I know your philosophy because I've understood and read about it for, for decades. And I and I I don't I have no shame in saying I copy a lot of what your philosophies have been um, because I trust I trust that it's it's been successful for me for that uh, and that's one good reason. Um, but but the idea that athletes they just train too hard and then they don't train hard enough and they don't rest hard enough they don't recover hard enough just just give us a summary of. Now, how you think you've evolved that your your idea of the train harder and recover harder? Yeah, when I first started coaching, it was kind of like the issue was how many hard workouts could you fit in in a week? That was pretty much the way I saw it. And so I not only overwhelmed my clients, I overwhelmed my, myself with training to the point that you'd eventually break down. I, I, I had probably every running injury that's ever been known to runners over the course of humankind on this planet. Uh, I've experienced every every leg injury there is uh, back when I was training that way. And I learned over time, I just, I just couldn't do that. I, I had to back off and make sure the, the workouts that were the most important were the ones that I was most prepared to do and, and could give the best performance to. When I could do that, then I started getting better race performances also. 
the athlete who tries to win the workout, I have always told my athlete, is going to lose the race. If you're out there always trying to beat somebody in the pool, beat somebody on the bike, beat somebody on the run, even though all it is is a workout, you're destined to lose when it comes to the race because you're working too hard. You look at what's happened to the best athletes in the world. You look at their what they've been doing in recent years. They've been turning something like gigantic amounts of time very slow and easy. And I mean very easy. Stuff that would be embarrassing for most athletes to do. And the athletes who are some of the best athletes in the world, that's what they do on a daily, on an almost daily basis, is they train very slow and easy because they've learned what that means is when it comes time to do a hard workout, it can be truly hard. They can truly push their limits on those days. So what I've kind of evolved over the years, especially with my with the athletes I've worked with who are age group athletes, so I call it a five-two approach to training. So five days a week they train easy, and two days a week they train hard. The five days easy must be easy. I would encourage them not to even do it with anybody else, all by yourself. Stay away from other people. Other people will screw you up. Uh, if you go for a ride to somebody it'll become a half wheel race <laughs> person put their wheel halfway in front of yours. You put yours halfway in front of theirs and this continues for the entire workout. It's no longer an easy workout. It's becoming harder and harder and harder. Same thing with running, same thing with swimming. So I say five days a week, you need to be doing it by yourself. It needs to be very easy. Now if you do it with somebody else, it needs to be somebody you can trust to go easy. And those people are hard to find. I refuse where I live. I refuse to train with anybody on my easy days. Somebody says, Hey, let's go for an easy ride. I know what that means. That means moderately hard <laughs> and I am not going to do it. So I just turn them down. Say, how about we meet you on Wednesday when I do my hard ride and we'll do it. We'll do it together. Then, then we can go hard together and we'll kind of like help each other. But when we do an easy day, we actually hurt each other. We don't help each other. So I've kind of evolved this five, two thing. It's along the lines of what uh, we've been calling polarized turning, the 80-20. It's almost 80-20. It's like 70-30 is what it works out to be. But it doesn't have to be precise to the, to the number. It doesn't have to be exactly 80, exactly 20. And I found it works for most athletes. It's, it's just, a, just an easy way of deciding what we're going to do in turning. Five days easy by yourself. Two days hard. If you want to go with somebody else, perfect. So that's the way I've evolved. We can understand where that uh, evolution has come from because unless you make it that specific and say it's 5-2 that clearly, people won't listen and do it. But you are training for three sports. So how can you train uh, hard enough for three sports in two days only? What's actually happening on those two hard days? And people would say, how am I getting enough out of the week? Yeah, we're doubling up. On the two hard days, they're doing two hard workouts in a day. Um, and it depends on what they're training for. If they're training for an Ironman, that's completely different than training for an Olympic distance race. So I'm going to be uh, design workouts that I can do two of them in the same day. It's going to be uh, maybe uh, maybe going to start off with a with a run workout, a hard run workout first thing in the morning. Later in the afternoon, come back with a, a hard bike workout. They're not going to be the same systems. One bike, one the run workout may have been something along the lines of aerobic capacity, which is fairly high intense workout on the track doing intervals, for example. The afternoon workout on the bike is going to be more along the lines of muscular endurance, anaerobic threshold type of stuff, zone six, seven sort of thing. So that's what we're going to do on, on the bike in the afternoon. So it'll always be two workouts a day and I'll, I'll rotate which workouts we're doing back to back. Some of these will be bricks, a bike run workout where they're going to, uh, bike hard and come off the bike and run hard. And we'll define what that means for them on that particular workout, um, how long the, it is on each leg and how intense it is. But that, that's the whole idea is to make sure we're getting in. What they're winding up getting is four workouts a week in those two days that are um, quality workouts. And they're coming into those two days fresh and rested because they've been keeping it nice and easy all the time that's gold uh that is exactly what we want our listeners to hear and uh it, it's always good coming from someone else rather than from me um <laughs> and and let's just dig a little bit further into um you started to talk about you know it might be different for iron man it might be different for sprint it might be different for olympic and even 70.3 
the intense sessions, is there a difference if you're doing Ironman as compared to Olympic? Is, is, the, is the intensity for Ironman a little bit lower, say zone four, five instead of zone six, seven? Or are you still getting your Ironman people to do some zone six, seven work? Um, what's, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it depends on what time of the season we're in. Um, base training is certainly a lot different from what I would have the athlete doing in the last 10, 12 weeks before the race, what I call the build period. And so if we talk about just the build period, for example, when things are getting much more specific to the race, I'm starting to do things that are specific to the race. So, for example, on the bike, um, what I would have the athlete do, first of all, I require everybody I coach to have a power meter. It's the same as us. They've got a power meter. They've got to have a heart rate monitor. And they've got to have a speed and distance device GPS to running. They don't want to buy one of those things. I'll help you find a different coach, but it's not going to be me. So you got to have those three things because I've got to know what's going on. I don't care if you look at it really or pay much attention to it, all the data, but I've got to know what's going on. The data is for me, not for you. So I've got to, I've got to see those numbers. And so consequently, let's say we're training for an Ironman and it's an age group athlete. Um, I know on the bike, this athlete's going to have to be between something like 60 and 70% intensity factor when they do their long rides, um, some portion of the long rides, not the whole long ride at that intensity, but some portion of the workout's got to be 60 to 70% because on race day, that's what they've got to do. If they don't get to 60%, they're going to have a hard time making the cutoff. If they go above 70%, they're either going to be on the podium, which is great, or they're going to walk the marathon. <laughs> so that becomes something I want to ingrain. I want the athlete to come to understand exactly what this feels like. When I'm riding between 60 and 70% on a longish ride, what does that feel like? So if the battery fails that day on their power meter, I want them to be able to do it even without the battery, without the power meter. Still ride 60 to 70 percent. So some days I'll have them put a piece of tape over their power meter so they can't read the numbers. And I tell them to ride 60 to 70 percent. Then when we get done, I compare what they did with what their numbers were. So we get so they start getting a re feedback on how it feels and being able to do what's required, even if you don't have a power meter. So that becomes the whole thing is, is to train them. And, and, and I, I believe the bike is, is the key in triathlon. The bike is the key. Half, basically half the race is on the bike. If you screw up the bike, the race is screwed up because that's half the race. You can get by with screwing up the, the swim. It only makes up roughly 20% of the race. You can even get by with screwing up the run to a certain extent, not as much. It's, it's roughly 30% of the race, but the bike is half the race. So we've got to get this right. So that, that's what I'm always aiming for is when we're doing a race specific workout, especially on the bike. That's what we've got to aim for is this intensity factor that you've got to be in. And we're going to try to narrow that down. We know it's going to be 60 to 70%, unless you're a podium contender, 60 to 70%. If we can narrow that down to being high 60s, and I know they can do the whole thing at high 60s and still come off and run, then we aim at that. They become 67%, 68%, 69%. That becomes the workout. If I find they can't do that, it's got to be lower, 60, 61, 62, 63. That's what we aim at. So I want them to become, become very comfortable with what's required of them in the race so that on race day, they can, they can repeat it. They can do it exactly as they need to do it and not be left guessing um, what they're supposed to be doing on race day. It should be that they've, they've done it so many times in training that when they come to the race, it's nothing new at all. And I, we have that conversation before the race. This is just exactly what we've been doing in training. Nothing's new here. You don't have to, you don't have to experiment and find out anything at all. We've already done it. So all you got to do is go out and do what we did in training and you've got your race. That's all there is to it. And you, but it's, you've got to teach. That's the other things you got to teach also. Don't get caught up in a race. Don't try to beat people on the bike. Don't try to beat people on the run, the swim, et cetera. You got to find your race. And we're going we're to learn to do that race. Do you fit those race specific intensity sessions uh, on a Tuesday or Thursday? Because that's not high intensity. It's, you know, especially at an Ironman level, 
60 to 70 percent. It's not high intensity, but it's not recovery either. So you can't do it on one of the easy days, but it's not quite high intensity enough for the Tuesday, Thursday. And if we looked at a 70.3 training example, it would be between 75 and 90 90 percent for yeah for an age group. 70 to 80 typically for that for half, depending on who the athlete is. But yeah, that that becomes a hard workout because now now we're training for not only is it it's a moderate intensity, 60 70 percent is moderate. However, we're doing a long ride. The comp, if when you start doing things that are beyond three hours, you know, three and a half, four, four and a half, five hours, and you're holding 60 to 70 percent, that is a hard workout. It's no longer easy. 60 to 70 percent for an hour is easy, it's not a big deal. Four hours, different story. So, intensity is not all is the same for every duration. As the duration becomes longer, the intensity that, that becomes hard moves down the scale. 60 to 70 percent for an Ironman distance bike is a hard workout. So that that's what I'm training for. So that's one of those hard workouts. And so that gets done on a Tuesday or Thursday. Yeah, it does have to be Tuesday, Thursday. Sorry, yeah, it could be. It could be. Usually, it's more like Wednesday, Saturday, or Thursday, Sunday. I try to get at least two days, three days between the hard workouts. So if the athlete has time to, to recover fully before doing it hard again. Do you have uh, a, a thought when you're coaching an Olympic distance athlete compared to a 70.3 or an Ironman? Is there a limit to the endurance that the, Olymp- the Olympic athlete should be doing? Is there sort of a, he's, he's, he's wasting his time if he's going to go over three hours as compared to an Ironman who's trying to train for a 180 kilometer bike and a, and a, and a 70.3, which is a 90 kilometer bike. Is there, you know, is there a real big difference between that Olympic distance guy and, and the more endurance for that endurance session? Yeah, there is. Um, if I was training an Ironman distance athlete, uh, more than likely we're going to do uh, some very long runs, three hours, maybe even three plus. For the sprint distance or for the Olympic distance athlete, it's going to, for, for the most part, there are exceptions. For the most part, it's going to be like two hours or shorter. It's going to be enough to build endurance, but not enough to create a lot of a lot of fatigue. So it'll just be um, it'll be typically two hours, hour and a half for my age group athletes is very common. That that's kind of like their most common long runs, an hour and a half. But at the other end of that, the highest that typically we'll have them do is two hours, but we'll do very few two-hour runs. It'll be mostly like an hour and a half for Olympic. And your philosophy around swimming is is so technique focused, uh, and is that why you wouldn't you're not mentioning you know any hard high intensity swim sessions on these hard days? They can be done on the easy days because you don't want them focused on intensity. You want it focused on technique. I want them very focused on technique. I've put on uh, camps uh, for something like I don't know the last twenty plus years. First thing we always do in a camp is uh, first day is they swim 500 meters time trial to see what they can do when they're fresh. Because I've told them when they they come to the camp, they need to to arrive fresh. So you need to have an easy week, the week before the camp, because it's going to be a big week. You're going to be putting in 20 hours, maybe more, which is probably more than you've ever done in your entire life for an age group athlete. So you've got to be fresh when you come in. So the first thing they do when they're fresh, they swim 500 meter time trial. Then... For the next typically four or five days, all we do is 25s with drills. That's all they do. Never swim more than 25, never swim fast. We just swim 25 with drills. At the end of the week, last day, I test them again, 500 meter time trial. Now they're tired. Now they've been through roughly 20 hours of training, which is a gigantic week for most age groupers. And now they're swimming 500 meters again. What I found over the years is roughly 90% of the campers had a faster time than they did on day one when they were fresh. And all we did was work on their technique. All I did was try to make them more efficient. Swimming is about efficiency. It's not about what we typically think in other sports, like running, for example, aerobic capacity and, and lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold are key determiners of, of performance in swimming. It's 90% efficiency. It's a, it's a skill sport is what it is. It's skill. It's like golf. You don't see golfers going out and doing intervals. All they do is hit balls because they know what they got to do is get really good at hitting balls. It's not, it's not, 
how fast they can walk the course. They just got to be able to hit balls. Yeah. What I look for in the swimmers is I want to see them get to 90 seconds per hundred. If we can get to 90 seconds per hundred, then you can start doing intervals. Hmm. Until you get to 90 seconds per hundred, we're going to focus on technique. I want you to become very, very efficient. And, there's only, and there's only, I try to keep it very simple. There's only four things they have to learn. I'm not going to go into all that. There's only four things they have to get right in the pool. And each one of them has got at least one of those things they're screwing up. And that's what's keeping them from selling 90 seconds per, per hundred. Until we can get that thing or things figured out, they're destined to be slow no matter how many intervals they do. They can do intervals from sun up to sun down, and they will not get any faster if they're, if they're inefficient. If they're wasting energy, it's, it's totally a waste of time to do intervals. Do you want to list them for us, the four things? <laughs> Now, then, then you'll probably want me to do in details of what they mean, but yes, I'll list them. They're called uh, PDLC, P stands for posture. That's the most basic thing. What I find is the most age grippers, I start with them, have very poor posture in the pool. They've got their head up and their butt down. So they're kind of swimming this way. And so I've got to get them to the point where they can get the right posture, which is on top of the water. So that's the first thing to work on. That is usually pretty easy to teach. The next thing is their um, uh, direction. The, a lot of swimmers, most swimmers, I've most age group swimmers, don't swim in the right direction. They, they reach across their body with their arms. So they do this sort of thing. They're always crossing over the center line of their body with their arms. Until they quit doing that, they're never going to be fast. It's kind of like running with your legs crossing over from side to side. You just can't be fast. It's just a waste of your time to do intervals. So that's the second thing that usually can be learned. That that takes a, it's a little more, more difficult than posture, but I can teach that. There's some drills they can learn to do. In fact, there's there's come some drills we do that I tell them once you've learned this drill, you you've been your direction has been terrible. Once you've learned this drill, what I want you to do is swim in this drill all the time. You're always doing this drill. Whenever you swim, I want you swimming in this drill. Don't worry about technique. Just swim this drill all the time because it forces you to get your arm out. We're supposed to be it's in front of your shoulder and says it in front of your face. So that's posture, direction. The third is length, a little more difficult now. Each one becomes more difficult than the previous one. Length has to do with your body's position in the water as you're making your stroke in, in the freestyle. So typically what happens is with triathletes is they swim like tugboats. They have no length. All they have is width. So they swim with the shoulders never, never leaving this position. So they don't do good swimmers swim this way. You know, they swim side to side as they swim. That's what a good swimmer does. A poor swimmer never does that. A poor swimmer just keeps their body like a tugboat in this position all the time and, and circles their arms around the tugboat. Until they learn to do this, they're never going to be a good swimmer. So we go through some drills and teach them how to do that, what it feels like. Some drills exaggerate the length. That becomes much more difficult. That typically takes like two days to get somebody to understand how to do that. And, may, and then eventually the guy has to become a habit. So that's posture, direction, length. And the final thing is catch. Most athletes have no idea what a catch is. They're told by the coach on deck all the time, you know, you need more catch. Reach over the barrel. And they tell them all kinds of things. But it's really simple. But they don't do it because they're never really exactly sure what they're supposed to be doing. So what I might have them do, for example, is if, they're, if their pool has, has diving platforms at the end of each lane, I'll have them go to the end of the lane, stand at the end of the lane facing the wall, put your hands up over your head on the platform with your palms on the platform to see if you can pull yourself out of the water. That's a catch. Try to do it now with your, your hands in this position. Put your the wrist on top of the platform and see if you can pull yourself out of the water. It is not going to happen. You can't do it. you got to be in this position. That, that's the catch. That's what a catch is. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. It's not complicated at all. But the complicated part is we've been teaching athletes, triathletes, for all these years how to swim like, like pool swimmers swim. They're not pool swimmers. They're open water swimmers. Open water swimmers swim differently than pool swimmers. And one of the things they do differently is their catch. Pool swimmers stick their arm and hand in the water, fingers point at the next wall, and immediately they get a catch. That's what a good swimmer does in the pool. Watch Olympics or open water swimmers, what they do 
is they reach over the water, usually with a straight arm, and the first thing that enters the water is their fingers, not the palm of their hand, their fingers. Fingers enter the water first, and as soon as the fingers enter the water, they start to pull. That's the catch. The idea I try to teach the athlete is the palm of your hand is facing the wall behind you. This is extremely difficult for people mm. to learn because for, for some cases, years and years and years, then keeping their palm facing the bottom of the pool. That's like having your wrists on the platform at the end of the, pool, the, the lane. You cannot get yourself out of the water. You cannot pull yourself from that position. You've got to get in this position to pull yourself. So we, there's lots of drills we do for this, and this goes on for a long time also. The bottom line is when they leave the camp, they've learned what, it, what they're supposed to do. Now they've got to take it home and make it habitual. It's got to become the way they always swim. If they go back to doing intervals again, they're right back to where they were before. No posture, no direction, no length, no catch. All they do is create lots of bubbles around themselves and don't go very fast. That's just a waste of time. So I, I really focus a lot on efficiency. We've got to make you a very efficient swimmer. It's a, it's a great answer. And I think the, the, the perfect practice scenario is, is one that comes to mind. And, and you, you use the golf analogy. And if a, if a golfer goes out onto the practice driving range and continues to practice his hook, when he comes to the main day, he's going to hook his tee every day. And if, if the swimmer's not practicing, you know, the catch, the reach, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to swim the same way. And, and you know, that is the difference between riding and running and swimming, in my opinion. It's a skill acquisition. It needs to be a technique-based approach, whereas an aerobic approach to running and riding is, you know, technique is important as a runner, obviously, and as a cyclist, but it's not the same uh, emphasis as, as a swimmer. You, you can be as fit as you like in the water with poor technique and you'll swim the same forever. Exactly right. Yeah, it, swimming is a, is a skill sport. That's what it is. Now, if you've been started swimming, you're five years old, you learn these skills, no problem at all. If you start swimming, you're 35 years old, big challenge. You've got to learn something that you've never really worked on before and it's not, it's not normal. You, don't, you know, water is not a normal mm. habitat to be in. So you've got to learn something you never figured out before and you've got somebody on deck that's trying to get you to swim like a pool swimmer, um, like you're an Olympian, and it's just not going to happen. You've got to learn to make the technique. You've got to learn to, to, to do the most basic things to be a good swimmer. One of the questions I wanted to ask was another summary question, and I know they're difficult to answer, uh, but one of your books is Fast After 50, and that is something that uh, you know we, we coach a lot of age groupers and are always interested in how you can keep getting faster um, the older you get, because a lot of people think that's limitation. So could you summarize for us some of the biggest lessons uh, from that book, for example, and in your coaching philosophy? Yeah. Um, let's start about where the, where the, how the book got started. It, it got started because I was about to have a big birthday, one that ended with a zero. And um, I decided to give myself a birthday present, which was to read all the research I could on aging athletes and see what I could learn that might help me become a better athlete when I got older. And what I discovered was there was an overwhelming amount of information in the research on this topic. A gigantic change from 15 years prior when I'd written the first book on this topic when there was almost no research at all on aging athletes. At this point in time, by the second, when I got to the second uh, birthday of mine, I realized the man was just a gigantic uh, wealth information here. And I've got to figure out what it is I can do to become a, to continue to, to improve as an athlete or to, as, as probably not a good term to use, to maintain my position and to keep it from dropping too fast. Cause never, you're not going to improve it for the next 30 years. You're not going to go from age 50 to age 80 and getting better every year. It's not going to happen. It's going to go down. The, the problem is we've got to slow down how fast it goes down. That's the issue. So that's what I was looking for in the research. How can I decrease the decline in fitness over, year, over the years? And what it came down to was just some really basic things. The number one thing that happens to athletes as we get older is our aerobic capacities decline. In, in people who are, are um, uh, lethargic, don't really do much activity at all, it declines about 15% per decade. That's gigantic. 
15% loss of VO2 max is a gigantic number. For athletes who do a lot of long, slow distance, they go out and do fitness, jogging, et cetera, they decline somewhere around 10% per decade, about 1% per year. Better, not great. What the research showed is that athletes who do intervals, who continue to race, who continue to do things that are high intensity, they lose performance at something in the neighborhood of about seven to seven and a half percent per year as they age. Much better. It's half of what the your you know your lazy neighbor next door is, is achieving in terms of VO2 max. So that's the first thing. So what that comes down to is the athlete has got to do some high intensity training. The research that led to that conclusion was was golden research. It was research that followed elite athletes for 20 years. Mm. See what happened to them mm. and how their lifestyles changed, how their training changed, and what happened to the VO2 maxes. And that lesson was those three points were the lessons that came out of it. The athletes who quit training, quit running. It was a running study. They lost, they started losing 15% per year, despite the fact they were elite athletes. 20 years later, they're now losing it, losing VO2 max to the rate of 15% over 10 years. The runners who were elite athletes 20 years ago who stopped racing and stopped doing intervals, but just kept jogging, that was the group that was losing at the rate of about 10%. The athletes who kept on racing, who kept on doing intervals, despite their aging years, were the ones who managed to maintain it at somewhere around 7.5% over a decade of loss. So that became the bottom line is we need to, we need to do some high intensity training. You just can't quit doing that just because you're old. Mm -hmm. And I hear that all the time from athletes. I'm, I'm 40 years old. So I need to stop doing intervals and just start doing long, slow distance. Big mistake, big mistake. You need to keep on doing the high intensity stuff. So that was the first lesson that was learned. Second lesson I learned was that as we get older, we tend to gain more body fat and we lose muscle. Your body weight may stay the same, but there's a change going on in our bodies. We're, we're losing muscle and gaining fat for most people. What we need to do is make sure we're, we're keeping this under control. There are lots of ways to do this. Lifting weights is something we should be doing as we get older. You can't stop lifting weights when you get to age 50. In fact, it becomes much more important. The 20 year old, it doesn't matter whether a 20 year old lifts weights or not. They're going to be, you can make them into a great athlete without lifting weights. 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, if you're not doing something to maintain muscle mass, you're going to see a great decline in performance. So lifting weights is critical to that. Interestingly enough, those two things uh, lead to the third thing. Third thing is you got to get enough sleep because that's when the hormones are being created. That's when the body is rebuilding itself. So if you're doing intervals, guess what intervals do? They cause your body during sleep to release hormones. When you lift weights, guess what that does? Mm -hmm. It causes your body during sleep to, to release hormones. We are doing the things that are most, some of the things that are most effective for producing changes in your body's fitness by doing these other workouts, these other things. So they all fit together. It's just kind of like a package. Those are the big three. There's lots of other stuff that went into this, but those were the big three. That's fantastic. And it's almost uh, reassuring that what you were doing when you were, you know, a young competitive athlete, and now that you're an aged athlete, 50 and above, it's not too dissimilar training, is it? You, you still need to have the, a similar structure. So we don't have to radically change anything because we're getting older. And and I've absolutely had that philosophy with my own training where I refuse to stop doing intensity stuff. I refuse to just accept that I'm aging and I want to have that decline slower. I, I want to make sure that I can stay at a level for as long as possible. And I've figured that out myself, that I need to do the intensity. I, I need to have that... that um, that ability to continue to improve my fitness. And the only way to do that is to do the similar stuff that I was doing when I was younger. Um, I may not be able to achieve the same times or power numbers, but I know that it's at my capacity as, as a 50 or 60 year old. Um, and I suppose that's one of the things that, uh, that, you know, was really good from getting out of what we got out of that book, uh, 50 and over. Um, it was, it was a real, a real point 
to to make sure that people are understanding that, that you know you don't all of a sudden when you start getting old stop doing things that you know that allowed you to be as fit as you want interestingly exactly. i don't know if you've uh, had an example similar to this but uh we've tested dad's vo2 max and it is uh, a lot lower in terms of its just a number um than when dad was tested when he was younger but your power numbers dad are actually not too dissimilar to what they were 10 years ago uh, especially your ftp and your ability to hold um, certain power and you know if you look at strava segments you're still um, on certain days riding as well as you know your king of the mountain times 10 years ago so uh, even though the aerobic capacity has dropped the ability to perform, perform is still there from maintaining an intense training load yeah that intense training load does more than just build your aerobic capacity it also maintains your economy which is the efficiency thing i was talking about with swimming and on the bike economy is also still important if you're uneconomical you're going to waste energy if you waste energy, your FTP goes down. So you've got to be economical. And you've also um, got to have a, a high anaerobic threshold as a percentage of your VO2 max. There's all kinds of examples of this in the sports world. Um, a good one, this goes back quite a ways. Uh, uh, Gerard, I'm sure, would be very familiar with this. Back in the 1970s, uh, two of my heroes were Bill Rogers and Frank Shorter two uh, marathoners from the 1970s. I won't go into detail on these guys, but they were they were big time. They were the 1970s and best runners in the world, these two. And um, what I learned about them was that Frank Shorter had a very low VO2 max. Even though he won the gold medal in the Olympics in 72 and silver in 76 and won lots of other races besides that, he had a VO2 max of 72, which is for a professional athlete, elite athlete is rather, uh, you know, Average. rather low. Mm. It's nothing. That's nothing to, to brag about at all. Whereas Rogers had a VO2 max of 78. In 1989, I got to go for a run with these two guys. They were both in Boulder, Colorado, and I was invited to come down and spend the, spend the day with them. And so we went for a run together. And so on, on one side of me, I've got. Frank Shorter, who's a gold medalist, silver medalist, who has a VO2 max of 72. And I could tell as he was running next to me, it was like a, like a deer running next to me. He, was, he had this beautiful, smooth way of running, no effort whatsoever, just floated. It was like snow falling off a tree branch. I mean, it was just like effortless. On the other side of me, I've got I've got Bill Rogers running next to me. He's won the Boston Marathon five times. He's one of the best marathoners in the world. The VO2 max is 78. But I can see out of the corner of my eye, his arms are flailing from side to side. His legs flail. He's got, you know, he wastes a tremendous amount of energy while he's running. So he's got a very low efficiency. So when these guys came to head to head in a race, either one can win mm -hmm. because they had this, these balancing things between them. A shorter, not been efficient, you'd never have heard of him. Mm -hmm. He would just been another runner. Had Rogers not had a VO2 max of 78, we would have never heard of him because his efficiency was terrible. So we, we have to take all this stuff to make somebody into a good athlete. It can't just be one. It's a combination of all three. It's a really great answer. Uh, to finish off the conversation, Joe, we'd like to ask you about uh, your personal habits. Uh, you get a lot done. You've always got so much on the go. Um, you have are up to book number 19. I think that's correct. Uh, I'm working on number 18 right now. 18, 18. Um, <laughs> and you still get up every morning as you have for the last 20 or 30 years and read a research article. Can you give an insight into your daily habits, your kind of training schedule and your own sleep schedule, what you try to stick to? Yeah, um, sleep is no problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I have a habit. We, 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 we're just the opposite. We, you know... My wife fell asleep last night before seven o'clock. We were watching something on TV. And most out of the corner of my eye, she was sleeping in the chair next to me. Uh, and so I started feeling a little bit sleepy myself. We were in bed by 7.15 last night and got up this morning, I think around five o'clock in the morning, something like that. So we were in bed for, I don't know, five, nine hours, something like that, sleeping. Uh, so sleep has never been a problem for me. I've, I've, that's always been easy. So that's that's a big part of my life is I want to make sure I get enough time in bed. I want to sleep a lot. And uh, so that's always been part of it. 
in the end, you mentioned the research. I get up every day, and one of the first things I do every morning is I, on the corner of my desk, I'm sitting at my desk right now. On the corner of my desk over here, I have a stack of research abstracts, which are summaries of research studies. And um, every day I pull one off the top, one off the top of the pile and read this research study, see if there's anything here that could help me as a coach and as an athlete to improve. And um, I've been doing that for uh, going on 40 years now. And um, it used to be hard to get these, these abstracts. Now it's a piece of cake. They're all over the internet. And you can find them very easily. So I'll do that every day. If I find one I like, I, I take a, um, a card that's about this big. We call, in the U.S., we call it a three-by-five card. And I summarize the, you know, I read the research study, go back and find the research study, read it, and then summarize the study on the card. I get it, get it all into what, what this card thing about in one small card. And on the other side of the card, I indicate, you know, the, the details. Who was who who was who are the authors of the study? What was the name of the study? What the publication was in, when did it come out? So if I ever want to find the study again, I can I can I've got the research data here that I can go back and find it. Those then get get put into boxes. I've now got, as you can imagine, lots of boxes of, of research studies and they're all categorized. And so it goes into a category um, every, you know, every time I complete a, a card like that. And then when I come time to write a book uh, or somebody asks me a question, I go back to the book or to the box, pull out the cards that give me information about that topic read through them all, find out what I've what I've been writing about over the years. And so it kind of keeps me fresh in my mind about what's going on in the world besides what's going on in my head. Things are going on outside of me are being recorded on these cards. Then I go for a workout. Um, every morning I get a, I, I go for a, a workout. Um, today was two and a half hours on the bike. Um, easy ride. And uh, so I do that, the five, two thing. I do that every day myself, exactly on that platform. Um, we watch what we eat. My wife is a, has become a, an excellent sh um, chef, if you will. I wouldn't call her that to her face because she didn't think herself being a chef. But she, she understands the way I like to eat and how we should be eating. And she prepares food in that way. And so... I'm trying to do things, and I lift weights twice a week. And there's lots of other detailed things here in my life besides just the stuff we've been talking about. I play golf, for example. In fact, I'll probably go to the golf later, golf course later this afternoon. So I, there's lots of things in my life besides just training. But training probably is number one, numero uno in my life is is the, the athlete lifestyle. That's fantastic. Uh, and when I when I hear you speak about how you how you go through your daily routine, it, it just reflects how an athlete should be living almost with plan. You, you must have a plan about what you're doing and, and how important is that plan? And, and I suppose the consistency, and you are relentlessly consistent and we've got countless examples, um, which were in the introduction um, about, you know, for example, when you started writing um, an article each week, uh, um, when you were living in Boulder um, for athletes doing the the local, it was the 10K uh, challenge race and you were writing articles to help athletes prepare for that event. And you continue to do that for how many years, Joe? It was 20 years I did that. Almost to the day, I wrote a weekly article for 20 years. I've got a very boring life. <laughs> <laughs> Most people could not put up with the things I do in life because it's just kind of like, Straight ahead, following the following the arrows. <laughs> but it's great. It's great because I'm wanting that the listener to understand that. Um, uh, and we've had a lot of really talented athletes on our show. Steve Monaghetti, an Australian marathon champion, and his his training regime, he said, was boringly consistent. And <laughs> and that's how you become successful. Um, the the relationship between consistency and, and success. I just think can't be underestimated. You're 100 percent right. The most important thing in training, the most important thing, no matter anything else I've ever said or written about, the most important thing is, is that it's consistency. You've got to train consistently. If you aren't training consistently, 
you're never going to succeed. Now, people can, don't under, quite understand the word consistent. That does not mean do the same thing every day. That's what a lot of people take that to mean. It just means whatever your plan calls for, you do it every day. Whatever I'm doing, if I'm doing, I'm doing a run on Monday, and I'm doing a, a long ride on Tuesday, and I'm filming on Wednesday, whatever it may be, I just keep doing that. I keep following that plan. And that, that produces better results than any workout I could come up with. If you do workouts randomly, sometimes you do them, sometimes you don't. But for great workouts, or the option is you do terrible workouts, but you, you do them very consistently. I would take consistent, consistently done poor workouts every time. If you get out the door and just do something every day, you're going to improve. Fantastic. Joe, our final question we like to ask our guests is, what is a life lesson that you've learned in the last 12 months that you'd like to pass on to others? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a tough question, uh, uh, Jordan. What would I say I've learned in the last 12 months? It can be longer if, um, if that helps. Yeah. Um, you know, my life is so consistent, as we're just talking about, so by the book that I'm not really sure there's a lot of things I've picked up, although I, I keep seeing more and more data. There's one guy I follow who is an Aussie, by the way. His name is Alan Cousins. Uh, he lives in Boulder, but he's an Aussie. He's got a, he's got a master's in exercise physiology, coaches, Ironman mostly. Great guy. And I love to read his stuff because he's always pointing out things that just support all the stuff that I keep saying all the time. Like he had an article or a, twi- uh, a tweet, I think it was yesterday morning I saw, that showed that this elite athlete, and I've forgotten who it was now, Iron Man athlete, was, was doing 80% of his runs were at such a slow pace that for most age group athletes, they'd have to be running something that this is, I apologize for this, they'd have to be running 10 minutes per mile. I know we're, we're thinking kilometers here, but uh, that, that's very, very slow. That's, that's the point of being embarrassing slow. But that's what these people are doing at this elite level. And he, brought, he keeps bringing up studies or not studies so much as summaries from elite athletes that this is what they're doing. This is the, here's what this athlete said they're doing in this article. And guess how slow this is. It's ridiculous. Mm. And more than 80% of their time is spent at this extremely, extremely slow pace that most age group athletes would never do because they find it embarrassing to do it. And yet the age group, the, the elite athletes are doing it. So that, that's something that keeps being driven home to me mm. by Alan on a weekly basis, he's always finding research or finding lifestyle reports from elite athletes that show they're doing exactly what we'd say they should be doing, and yet people refuse to accept it. So for, the age, for the age group, don't be afraid to slow down. Right. <laughs> Joe, what's what I just want to say, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. We have an enormous amount of respect for you and we really appreciate you giving your time on here. And Dad, I, I know you feel the same way. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a great uh, hour. It's the quickest hour that's ever been uh, on the podcast for me. It, and there's so many more questions we'd lo- love to uh, get your thoughts on maybe for another day. But uh, once again, we really appreciate you coming on uh, today. I know you've got a busy schedule with uh, the volume of books that you're providing with information and and we love the fact that you are just hell bent on helping other people in their lives to be better better athletes and uh and that's a great uh, a great attribute to have so thank you joe for your time and uh we look forward to chatting you uh sometime soon thank you jordan gerard i, I enjoyed the conversation myself it's always a lot of fun to talk about athletes and sport thanks joe cheers Bye.